This is Emily Mazzarello reporting from UCC. We're going out to Davis on the streets to hear what people have to say about certain things that we're going to talk about in our Love Davis series. Today's question is, what do you picture when someone says the phrase, living the dream? It's just being very, very happy. Making it to retirement. <laughs> this. <laughs> Laying on a hammock in the middle of the quad. A hammock. Doing what you want without fear, or doing what you love. I picture that it costs a lot of money. <laughs> um, I guess being successful, or um, accomplishing a goal that they previously set in their lives. Living the dream is that you are self-evident, and that you can uh, choose to be what you want to be, that you're free to do that. Uh, living the dream, living living in such a way that you don't have any regrets, you're not thinking like I could have done such and such differently and I could have ended up in such and such a way, but just kind of being content. Living a day and then having energy for the night. I don't even want to know what the last one means. <laughs> hey, good morning, my name is Matt, I'm one of the pastors here, it's great to, great to be with you. Uh, our protégés uh, just went backstage, but I wonder if we could tell them how glad we are that they're here. Just we all just cheer so loud. Doing the right thing or about righteousness and 
Jerusalem often thought about in terms of the Old Testament law. Well, we can see that in our city, a passion to do the right thing. We see that particularly in some of its emphasis, like environmentalism. Next week, we're looking at Athens, and Pastor Schumann will, pass, will preach his, his first sermon here, thinking about the way that the Apostle Paul sought to reach Athens. And we are a university town, and so we see a link between Davis and old Athens, that center of philosophy and thought and spirituality. And we'll, we'll see how Paul saw that as a door for the gospel. This morning, I'm going to be preaching on the Apostle Paul's efforts to reach the city of Corinth, specifically drawing on his words from 1 Corinthians, his letter, uh, ministering that young church there. Corinth is a city of passion. It is referred to in Bible commentaries as the Las Vegas of the ancient world. But it's also a city of drive for achievement, a powerful city, a wealthy city, a, a city of competition. And I think we can see commonalities to our city in Corinth. I've spent the last couple of weeks doing a lot of research on that city. And instead of just sharing with you what I found so you can kind of see the commonalities, I want to give you a taste of it. For you to understand Paul's words and for them to, to hit you and for it to unlock for you what that, what that truth might be for us in our time and our city, I think you need a taste of what it's like to have lived in Corinth. And so I need, you to, I need you to use your imaginations this morning. I want you to imagine with me that you are a citizen of the city of Corinth 2,000 years ago in the first century AD. Imagine that you are proud of the city that you live in. You're proud to live in such a metropolis of 700,000 people, second only to Rome within the Roman Empire. The city was once destroyed when Rome invaded, but now has been rebuilt and restored glory as the Roman capital of the province of Greece. And you are energized to live in such a center of commerce in culture, and the nightlife cannot be peace. You are proud of the fact that people come from all over the world to, to really live life to its fullest, to experience the Corinthian dream. You are a dock worker at one of the two great ports at either side of the isthmus that brings all major shipping in the region through the city. All the trade from northern Greece to southern Greece has to go across this land bridge, and all the shipping from east to west gets carried across this land as a shortcut. So it's become such a center of commerce. And you're particularly thrilled today because you were the lucky seventh caller at a local radio station and you won free tickets to the Isthmian Games. And you know just who you want to take with you. And so you invite your new friend Paul, who just has recently moved to Corinth and moved in with your neighbors, Priscilla and Aquila. He is a traveling Jewish tent maker, a really interesting guy. And in your conversations with him, he's been telling you about a guy named Jesus, who the locals call Crestus who has the power to forgive your sins and give you eternal life. And you've never heard such a thing before, so you, you want to hear more about it. So you invite Paul to go with you to these games, and you know he doesn't know much about the city yet, and so you say, hey, why don't you come with me to the games, and I'll give you a tour of the city on our way. And you're shocked because Paul has never heard of the Isthmian games. This really frustrates you because the Olympics are getting all the publicity lately, as though those are the only great games in Greece. And you remind Paul that you know, these games have all the same athletes and all the same sports, and they're even better because you hold them every two years instead of every four years. Never heard of the Isthmian games. Unbelievable. But Paul, he agrees to come with you to check it out. He really wants to kind of see the sights of the city. And the first place that you show him is, is the place where you work. You take him to the port on the eastern side. And you, should, you stand and you watch at the pier as a team of 200 slaves drags a merchant vessel from the far east up right out of the water. 
And you explain to Paul that as many as two-thirds of the population of the city is made up of slaves. So great is your wealth. <coughs> and then you watch as this team of slaves puts the ship onto a track and loads it onto, onto a cart, loads that onto a stone track that goes the four miles across the isthmus, and they begin to drag it across. And as they do, the sailors all jump out of the ship on shore leave. And they start yelling things like, party time! And what happens in Corinth stays in Corinth. And as they drag, the slaves drag their ship across the isthmus and they take their shore leave, you explain to Paul that what happens here is that the merchants are saving time and danger by going across the isthmus instead of going the 200 miles around the dangerous Peloponnese coast, which would be time and money and danger. You can just take the four miles across the stone track. And plus, the sailors are eager for their shore leave. As you continue on your walk, you show Paul where all the sailors are running to, and you say to him that you would call this the red light district, but actually the whole city of Corinth is a red light district. You uh, ask Paul if he'd like to get plastered before the game. Everyone does it, you say, he has at least 33 wine bars in this section of the city to choose from. Paul politely declines. Okay, Paul, how about hitting one of our world-famous brothels that we're known for, you say? You inform him that unfortunately the Temple of Aphrodite with its 1,000 shrine prostitutes is closed down now. But not to worry, because this is now available in all parts of the city. Again, Paul surprises you by declining. He says to you, you know, we really should talk about that. With no time to talk, because just then you come to the arts district, just in time to reach the grand finale of the day's poetry contest. Paul had never heard of competitive poetry before. But you explained to him, in Corinth, we'll compete about everything. We'll, we'll compete about art and, and poetry and oratory and sports. Here in Corinth, we're passionate about everything. Time is tight, so you join the converging crowds as you walk through the neighborhoods of the elite merchants with their new Corinthian-style architecture, their huge pillars, and you're just sure that Paul is impressed with the wealth of your city and the beauty of your architecture. Finally, you arrive at the stadium, and amidst the crowds, there's athletes everywhere, huge, hulking weightlifters, tough-looking boxers and wrestlers, and you see the fastest runners that you've ever seen, stretching their legs, warming up, running in place. The horn sounds of all the crowds and the alleys gathered together for the games, this great highest event of the year. And the crowd is electric because maybe this year you'll defeat Athens, that bitter rival. The starting sound goes and the racers go. And the crowd goes wild as the early as the local favorite gets out to an early lead. Will he be able to fend off the Spartan challenger? Yes! Victory! The crowd goes wild. The crowd goes nuts. Everyone is hugging and throwing things and making a mess of the place in absolute euphoria. And then a hush falls over the crowd as the mayor of the city goes to give the victor the grand prize and the the victor gets up on the podium, basking in his glory, and all the jealous eyes of Corinth look as the mayor pulls out the grand prize for all his labor. A crown made out of wilted celery. I kid you not. The, the prize is put ceremonially upon, looks something like that. The prize is put ceremonially on the victor's head. A crown of glorious celery. And he struts his stuff for all the people to see that he is the celery champion. And suddenly Paul starts laughing. And you're like, Paul, what, what are you doing? He's embarrassing you. This is a serious moment. This is the celery crown moment. Paul just starts laughing. He's like, it's made out of celery? Are you kidding me? All of this? All of this hype? All of this wealth? All of this commerce? All of this striving and training the athletes? And all they get is wilted celery. His laugh is contagious. You've never thought of this before. This is what you've always seen, what you've always known, what the athletes have always striven for. 
But now that he mentions it, you think, that is kind of funny. As you walk home, you ask Paul the question you've been dying to ask, and you say to Paul, you, meant, you talk to me about Jesus. I want to know more about this Jesus. I want to know more about this kingdom of God you've spoken of. What does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean to follow Jesus? How would my life be different if I was a Christian here in Corinth? And Paul thinks about it for a minute, and then he replies. Similar words that he would write later in 1 Corinthians 9. He says to you, do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Well, run in such a way as to get the prize. And everyone who competes in these games goes into strict training, but they do it to get a crown that will not last. For we Christians, we do it to get a crown that will last you begin to wonder what it would look like for you, a Corinthian, to begin living your life and using all of your passionate drive for something bigger and deeper and richer and more lasting than wilted self. Would you pray with me? Lord God, as we study your word, we pray you would open it to us. We pray you make this time fruitful. May we not live our lives for crowns that will not last. Speak to us in this time, Jesus. Amen. Okay, so in all fairness to the Corinthians, I think they'd have a comeback ready if he was to criticize the celery crowns. I think the Corinthians would probably say to him, Paul, you're missing the point. It's not just about celery. I mean, we can buy celery at the market. It's about the glory that it represents. Because, you see, Paul, I think they would explain, if you were walking through town in our city with a crown of celery on your head, everyone would respect you. Different culture. <laughs> People would look at you and say, there goes someone who has a celery crown. They would, they would admire you. When you wear a celery crown in our city, everyone applauds you. And they know you are the best. You are the master at something. So you see, Paul, it's not just about celery, it's about, it's about glory and praise and respect. Just think how proud you would be, Paul, if your son or daughter excelled above the other kids in their school and won celery crowns. You could put a bumper sticker on your chariot that says, my son is a proud celery crown winner at Corinth High School. Or better yet, imagine how proud you would feel if your child was to be a varsity celery crown winner in both a sport and a musical instrument in the same year. <gasps> Think of what the neighbors would say, Paul. And Paul's response is basically this. It's all celery! It's not going to last. These are all things that you're pursuing and things that you're achieving that are just going to wilt and rot and be gone before the year, before the week is up. Are you really going to spend your lives chasing celery? When I was a child, I was in lots of sports and lots of activities, and I loved collecting trophies. And even when it was just a trophy of participation, I pretended it was a victory. I was proud the day that I needed a second shelf for all of my trophies in my bedroom. But you know what happened to them? As I moved off to college, years went by, my parents just put them in a box, in the garage where they collected dust for a decade. And then at some point they were thrown into the trash and taken to a landfill with all of the rotten produce. My glory! Rotting in a landfill with celery. Might be different in Davis because all the celery is in a compost bin, but the point remains. <laughs> the point remains that all of our glory does not last. I told you the Corinthians were also not just a life of achievement, they were not just a life of achievement, but also a life of pleasure. And this can be found in the way they conducted their sexuality. It was a city full of brothels, Enjoyed prostitution, 
promiscuity of all kinds, all sorts of adulterous affairs. They, they had all sorts of unusual sexual relationships in Corinth. But you know, this is just pursuing a different dream. It's still just chasing salvation. I don't think it's all that different from America, this culture that we are a part of. We're so inundated with seductive images. Even, even standing in line to buy the celery for a sermon illustration, I'm flanked by, by magazines trying to entice with sexual <coughs> imagery. And, 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 and promiscuity has become so common. So ex you expect it on every television show. You expect people to behave a certain way. One of the story I heard a few years ago from one of our college students in our, in our church college group about her experience her first day of college here at UC Davis in the dorms. Her roommate, as she was unpacking her stuff, pulled out a, a, a whole bunch of boxes of condoms and began making a decoration on her closet door out of them with the express goal of using them all by the end of the year. What has become of us? What has become, what has happened that this young woman in our city felt like that's the way to live the dream? That's life to its fullest. I hope that your heart breaks with compassion when you hear that story. We as a church in Davis have to tell a better story, have to offer a better dream than that. Such as life. In Corinth, it was a party culture. Dozens and dozens of wine bars have been uncovered through archaeological excavations. In Corinth, every day was picnic day. <laughs> I think we can relate to that because we live in a binge society. Not just alcohol, we binge on everything. Americans are the largest consumers per person of any people group in the history of the world, by some margin. We mistakenly believe that that next drink, or that next piece of food, or that next car, that next achievement, that somehow consuming more happiness is right around the corner, and yet always eluding us because we are just chasing celery. So, what's the good news for Corinth? What's the good news for our city? What does the gospel have to say to it? The gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ tells us that there is something in this world worth more than a celery crown. There is something in this world that is permanent, that is eternal, that is lasting, that will not desert you or disappoint you, and that can satisfy all of your deepest hunger and craving. That is the good news, that is the gospel articulated for a city of passion. And when Paul seeks to speak to them, he does not attack so much their striving. He actually, at some points, affirms it and wishes all Christians could have such, such discipline and passion, but he actually lifts them up to a bigger I'll give you some examples as we walk through the text. In 1 Corinthians 6, he's speaking uh, specifically to their, their sexual culture. Uh, as people are coming to the church from the city, they're bringing in their culture with them. They're bringing in some of their paradigms of how to behave sexually into the church. And he's needing to correct them and teach them a better way. And he speaks to them about it. We see in 1 Corinthians 6, chapter 12, they quote to him, I have the right to do anything. You say, you know, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. You say, food for the stomach, stomach for the food, God will destroy them both, which apparently is like a phrase that in their minds justified anything they wanted to do. I don't quite understand how it worked, but our justification is not always more logical. And then he says, the body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. And the Lord for the body. By His power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and He will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies 
are members of Christ himself. Shall I take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it said the two will become one flesh. He's, he's quoting the imagery in the scripture of the permanence of marriage and of that union. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? Notice the way what he's doing here. Notice the way in which he is ministering to a city of passion. He's not coming out as anti-sex, anti-fun, anti-body, anti-physical. He's not saying that. What he's doing is actually giving greater honor to the human body. He's saying somehow you've come to perceive the body as something lowly. And I want to tell you that the human body is not just a chunk of flesh to be thrown around. And sex is not just a fun activity on a Saturday night with whomever you happen to be with. Instead, he gives greater dignity to the human body, saying, you, member of the body of Jesus Christ, your body is sacred. Your body is a temple for the Holy Spirit. And doing that, he's raising the vision of their own self-worth and saying that it matters how you conduct yourself. And then he begins to replace their, their image of how to relate to one another in these sort of serial encounters. And he, he moves it to something deeper and richer. I'll give you a sample of that from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. He speaks to them about love and what love really is. And he says, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. And it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. And then listen to what love does. Love always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes. And it always perseveres. Love never fails. He's saying love, real biblical love, is not celery. It's something real and deep and rich and lasting and meaningful. Then he connects with them in chapter 7, sex with its intended design purpose, and he speaks to them about the commitment of marriage which protects a couple. And two people oriented together in commitment, providing for each other and protecting each other all of their lives, never walking away and abandoning each other. What a more glorious picture than the salary that they're experiencing. It gives them a better dream. He's kind of forced to deal with the alcohol issue, the booze issue, and the binge culture issue in general in 1 Corinthians 11. What happened is this. Uh, there was sort of a communion feast, a, a, a it's like a church potluck where they're serving communion together. And uh, what happened is that some of the Christians who were there got drunk on the communion wine. And then they got the munchies and they ate all the bread. So then some of the poor workers showed up late after the night shift and there was nothing for them. They thought they were showing up to church and they just walked into like a fraternity party with some people laughing and joking on the floor. Nothing for them. And Paul addresses that. He says, I think that you've missed the point here. I think you're still living in the Corinthian dream of just consumption and just having it all yourself. He doesn't become anti-alcohol. He wants them to have wine and have a great time at their gathering. But he says, you know what you did wrong there is you drank it all yourself and you could have shared. And he gives them a new picture. Instead of this wild, drunken street party, he gives them a new picture of what human relationships could be about. He begins to describe the fellowship of the church. He says, what if you would have shared and how about this next time? How about you wait until everyone is gathered from all socioeconomic places, all ethnicities, all job statuses, 
And they all come together around one table as equals. Instead of thinking about what you can get and what you can take and how much you can consume for your own pleasure, what if instead you were more passionate about giving to everyone around you so that everyone could share and sit together in the fellowship? And what if you spend your time really getting to know each other and building each other up to Christ-like maturity and spurring each other on to love and good deeds, all while giving honor and glory to your Savior, Jesus Christ? That is not celery. That is the kingdom of God. And that is something worth living for. He raises their appetites to new levels for something better. Same thing happens with, with lawsuits and arguments among them. The Corinthians are known for their fighting and their using of the, of the Roman legal system to, to get at each other. And this has happened in the church. They, they are arguing and suing other brothers and sisters of Christ over stuff. And he says to them, why not rather be wrong? Why not prefer to be cheated? And once again, he replaces in their minds the dream they have of conquest and dominance and, and getting more and getting your way and being right with a passion for the honor of your brother and sister and their well-being. He says, that's not sorry. That's the kingdom. Returning back to chapter 9, when he's speaking about the games and the Isthmian games and the celery crown specifically and the athlete's passion for that, he notes what strict training and what endurance they go through and just how hard they work for that, all for the fickle applause of the crowd and a perishing crown. And he lets us know that Jesus has invited us into a life of service to the King of Kings. Not to gain the fleeting approval of the crowd, but instead to pour all of our passion and energy into the day in which we will hear the voice of our Savior say, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Come into the promised land. And we will be taken into the fullness of the kingdom of God in which we discover satisfaction for all of our deepest love. And that voice of the love and approval of God will ring out for all the ages. This is the hope, this is the gospel for city of passion. So who wants to live for celery? Who wants to spend yourself on behalf of the kingdom of God? This is a treasure that you have been given. And it's also your witness to the people around you. We need to be in the city. We need to be loving the city, not as judges, but as visionaries. Somehow this great vision of God needs to be displayed in our lives so that we as a church here in this place can make credible and believable and understandable the gospel of Jesus Christ for our world. Amen? Amen. All right, would you pray with me? <laughs> Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your counsel. We pray that we would be courageous to this place. We would pray that we would be the salt of the earth. We pray that you would give us the strength and the insight and the endurance to follow you in this. In Jesus' name.